All right, y'all, quarantine day four. I'm just here. I'm not showering before this thing because I don't have to, man. So, as always, I've provided you a set of learning objectives to begin this lecture with. And remember that there's also a handout. And what I would do is I would have that handout either printed out or up and available so you can see some of the kind of key points to take home from each of the lectures that we're doing. Now, because nobody likes watching a long YouTube video and this one's going to drag on for a little bit, we're going to jump right into the material. Anything you don't understand, you can kind of rewind and go back to. This will be posted on YouTube. Now, key points for today's lecture is one, we're going to talk about the sodium potassium pump and the establishment of the electrochemical gradient, which is a really important topic in anatomy and physiology. Two, we're going to talk about nervous tissue histology, nervous system function. We're going to give breakdowns of different divisions of the nervous system. We're going to talk about neuron function and briefly talk about the action potential because this is an introductory class. And then we're going to talk about the different anatomical and uh, functional classifications of neurons. Then we are going to talk about neurotransmitters that you need to know for this class. The basics of neuronal communication, and finally, we're going to tap, or, uh, cap that off with a quick discussion about neuroglial cells. So let's go ahead and get going. Now, with respect to the lab, you have a lab online that you can um, review the videos that I've posted for you, label the structures that you need to label. Those don't have an associated quiz, quiz with them, but they will be part of the exam that you're going to be taking for Unit 3, so just keep that in mind. Now, when we talk about membrane potential, membrane potential is the difference in the charge between the outside and the inside of the cell. In a living cell at rest, particularly neurons and skeletal muscle fibers and cardiac muscle fibers, which are going to be our focal points for this class, the outside of the cell carries a net positive charge, while the inside of the cell carries a net negative charge at rest meaning when the cell isn't doing anything, there's no electrical signal being fired, the cell is at rest. So it's in an anticipatory mode waiting to do whatever that cell is going to do. You can actually measure membrane potential by taking an electrode and measuring the charge differential, right, the difference in charge between the inside and the outside of the cell. One of the numbers you're going to have to remember for the exam is negative 70 millivolts. Negative 70 millivolts is the average charge or the average membrane potential of a neuron, meaning the difference in charge between the outside and the inside of the cell. Now, we've talked about different types of transport in this class, and in unit exam one, we talked about passive transport. Passive transport does not require metabolic energy in the form of ATP. Particles move with their concentration gradient, not against their concentration gradient. And simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis were examples of that. Today we're going to focus our attention more on primary active transport because primary active transport is really important with respect to understanding how the electrochemical gradient is established, how we use it, and why ions or chemical disequilibrium exist, meaning why do you find more of a certain type of ion outside the cell than inside the cell. So in primary active transport, we use ATP. We use ATP and we use the energy from the hydrolysis or the breakdown of ATP to move particles not with their concentration gradient but against their concentration gradient. And it's one of the only reasons you're alive. We are a system that's constantly in disequilibrium. We, we are in steady state but we maintain a chemical disequilibrium and I will elaborate on that in just a moment. So just reviewing passive transport. When we look over here, we see the concentration gradient for the different particles that are moving, and we see simple diffusion, so we know that has to be a nonpolar molecule. We know it has to be passive transport because no ATP is being used, and that solute particle is moving with rather than against its concentration gradient. We have channel-mediated facilitated diffusion for small polar molecules like sodium ions, potassium ions, calcium ions. Remember that these channels are proteins and that they're specific. So if I say a sodium channel, that channel will only conduct or facilitate the movement of sodium. If I say a potassium channel, that channel will only facilitate the movement of potassium. Finally, we have carrier-mediated facilitated diffusion. Again, a passive transport process because solute particles are moving with their concentration gradient. With 
Carrier-mediated facilitated diffusion, you have these large proteins that bind to solute particles, polar solute particles, but these tend to be larger polar solutes, such as sugar molecules or amino acids, and they don't exist in either an open or a closed conformation. In carrier-mediated facilitated diffusion, these particles need to bind. That protein undergoes a change in its shape that kicks those particles out on the other side of the cell membrane. Now we've talked about that, we went over that in our first exam. What we're going to be focusing our attention on today is primary active transport and how that ultimately plays a critical or crucial role in the function of the nervous system through the establishment of what's called the electrochemical gradient. Now whenever we talk about these proteins, remember where proteins come from. So in the nucleus, we have these long strands of DNA, and we can enroll uh, functional units of it called genes. These genes, through the process of transcription, are used to make mRNA. That mRNA, through the process of translation, is used to make a protein. Proteins are little pieces of molecular machinery that do work in the cell. The protein we're going to be focusing on for the next few minutes of our class discussion is the most important protein, in my opinion, in all of biological science, with the exception of maybe some of the plant proteins involved in the photosystems, but I'd argue, I'm a physiologist, so I'm going to argue for the sodium-potassium pump here, is the sodium-potassium pump. So we have genes that code for the protein structures that ultimately make up this piece of machinery called the sodium-potassium pump. Sometimes I ask on an exam, the sodium-potassium pump is made of sodium, true or false? That would resoundingly be false. The sodium-potassium pump is made of chains of amino acids linked together covalently via peptide bonds that fold into a three-dimensional shape to form a machine that does work. What they move, right, what that piece of machinery moves is sodium and potassium. So... The most important process in biological science for me in this class is the activity of the sodium-potassium pump. And I want to kind of get your bearings in the image we're looking at right here. So outside of the cell, remember, we refer to as the ECF, or the extracellular fluid, and inside the cell we refer to as the ICF. So if I say ECF to ICF, I'm essentially saying movement from the outside to the inside of the cell. If I say ICF to ECF, I'm saying movement from the inside to the outside of the cell. Now, when you think about the sodium-potassium pump, it is a protein. It's made up of linked amino acids that fold into a very uh, eloquent three-dimensional shape that allows this protein to function. We often simplify this by drawing proteins with the blob model. Now, even though we can only see one sodium-potassium pump here, within the cells of your body, you have like 200 trillion cells, within the membrane of each of those cells, you have anywhere from thousands to millions of sodium-potassium pumps. So collectively throughout your body, you have tons and tons of these. And a significant percentage of the energy you use each day is used simply to fuel the activity of the sodium-potassium pump. Estimates are anywhere from 20 to 35 percent, depending on what tissue is most active at the time. So the sodium-potassium pump is very important because it establishes what's called the electrochemical gradient. And it does that through the following. So for every cycle of the sodium-potassium pump, the pump binds to three sodium, scion sodium ions inside the cell, or in the ICF, and it moves those sodium ions against their concentration gradient to the ECF. So for every cycle of the sodium-potassium pump, three sodium ions are moved from the inside to the outside of the cell. Once the external surface is exposed, Right, that pump will bind two potassium ions outside of the cell and it will use the energy from the hydrolysis of ATP to move those two potassium ions against their concentration gradient from the outside to the inside of the cell at the expense of one molecule of ATP. The reason this is called primary active transport is because this protein is actively using ATP, meaning it's breaking down ATP to ADP and inorganic phosphate, or PI, and it's using the energy from that catabolic or hydrolysis reaction to move those ions against their concentration gradient. Now, if the sodium-potassium pump continues to function, what's going to happen, and why does this become so important? 
So one of the questions you're probably going to get on the exam is something like this. And I just want to orient you to what we're looking at. So out here, we would consider the ECF. In here, we would consider the ICF. Here we have a mitochondria. Mitochondria produce ATP, and the sodium-potassium pump uses ATP for every cycle. So for every cycle of the sodium-potassium pump, three sodiums get moved from the inside to the outside of the cell. Two potassiums are moved from the outside to the inside of the cell at the expense of one molecule of ATP. These ions are not being moved with their concentration gradient, they're being moved against their concentration gradient. And I'm going to show you how that gradient is established by the sodium-potassium pump and why the sodium-potassium pump is so important with respect to membrane potential. So let's say that we have negatively charged anions inside the cell, and many of those negatively charged anions inside the cell are proteins. So when you see that P with a neg, that's not all of the anions in the cell, but we'll talk about negatively charged proteins because they don't move readily across the cell membrane. Now if I was to ask you to calculate total charge inside the cell right, right now before we've kicked on the sodium-potassium pump, what you'd do is you'd count the number of positive charges in the cell, which in this case is 9. So there are 9 sodium ions in the cell. And you'd count the number of negative charges inside the cell, which in this case is 9. If there are 9 positive and 9 negative charges inside the cell, the total charge inside the cell would be 0. So at the moment, the cell is neutrally charged. But let's see what happens when we kick on the activity of the sodium-potassium pump. So for every cycle of the sodium-potassium pump, the sodium-potassium pump, right, which uses ATP, and it uses the energy from ATP in order to move three sodium ions against their concentration gradient from the inside to the outside of the cell, two potassium ions from the outside to the inside of the cell, at the expense of one molecule of ATP. Now, after just one cycle of the sodium-potassium pump, let's recalculate what the total charge inside the cell is. Now, if we count all the positive charges, there's now 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So there are 8 positive charges and there are 9 negative charges because none of the negative ions moved. As a consequence of that, the charge inside the cell has now taken on a net charge of negative 1. And for the sake of simplicity, let's call it negative 1 millivolts. So that's after one cycle of the sodium-potassium pump. Let's see what happens after two. So three sodium ions are moved out of the cell. Two potassium ions are moved into the cell at the expense of one molecule of ATP. And what we see is now we have only seven positive charges inside the cell and neg nine negative charges inside the cell. Now the charge inside the cell is negative two, right? Because we have two more negative charges. If we continue with this, another cycle of the sodium-potassium pump is going to pump three sodiums out of the cell, two potassiums in at the expense of one molecule of ATP. The charge is going to be negative three. So for every cycle of the sodium-potassium pump, the cell becomes slightly more negatively charged because there's a fixed negative charge in the cell and we're moving net positive charge out of the cell. So the cell takes on a little bit of a net negative charge, right? The other thing that happens with every cycle of the sodium-potassium pump is a gradient develops. So we use energy in order to establish a gradient where there's a higher concentration of sodium outside the cell than there is inside the cell. So sodium concentrations in a healthy system or a living system or a cell system at rest are always going to be higher outside the cell than inside the cell, whereas potassium concentrations are going to be higher inside the cell than outside the cell. So that's really important because when we talk about the action potential, what we're essentially talking about is the movement of sodium and potassium. And you need to understand why sodium has a higher concentration outside the cell than inside the cell and why potassium has a higher concentration inside the cell than outside the cell. That is entirely an artifact of the sodium-potassium pump, which is extraordinarily important in a number of physiological functions, not the least of which is firing and action potential, which is something we're briefly going to talk about as this is an introductory class and it's not heavily emphasized in the common course objectives. So when you think about this term I've continued to use called the electrochemical gradient,
When I say the electrochemical gradient is established to a large degree by the activity of the sodium potassium pump, what I'm really saying is that for every cycle of the sodium potassium pump, three sodiums are moved from the inside to the outside of the cell, so sodium starts to build up in the extracellular space. Two potassiums are moved from the outside to the inside of the cell at the expense of one molecule of ATP. That gives the inside of the cell a net negative charge and the outside of the cell a net positive charge. Remember the charge difference between the outside and the inside of the cell is called that cell's membrane potential. So what the sodium potassium pump really does is it establishes membrane potential and it establishes something called the electrochemical gradient. Now gradients, remember, are when substances are moving from areas of high to low concentration. Why do we call this one, instead of just a concentration gradient, the electrochemical gradient? Well, we call it the electrochemical gradient first because there's a charge differential between the outside and the inside of the cell. And as a consequence of that, there's not just one force working on sodium, there's multiple forces. So sodium is attracted to the inside of the cell. Remember, it's a non-penetrant solute, so it can't get directly across the cell membrane because it's polar. But there's a force attracting that sodium back to the internal regions of the cell. And that force is electrical in nature because the negative charge is attracting the positive charge. So those sodium ions right, are energetically being pulled toward the inside of the cell. I sometimes hear it as sodium wanting to get back into the cell, and that's a fine way to put it although I don't know if sodium has sentient consciousness and can formulate the ideas associated with the behavioral state of want or desire, but that's all right. That's neither here nor there. Another thing that you have to think about with respect to the chemical gradient is the chemical gradient is just the concentration gradient. So not only is sodium attracted to the inside of the cell because it carries a positive charge and the inside of the cell carries a negative charge, but sodium is also attracted to the internal regions of the cell because sodium, which carries a positive charge, right, has a higher concentration outside the cell than inside the cell. So the concentration gradient for sodium would promote its movement back into the cell. We refer to the concentration gradient that's promoting the movement of sodium back into the cell as being the chemical gradient. Collectively, the charge attraction and the chemical gradient promoting the movement of the, these ions because there's an electrical and a chemical force associated with it is called the electrochemical gradient. Now the electrochemical gradient is established by the sodium potassium pump and it's also maintained by a couple of other things. Of note here are these small channels referred to as potassium leak channels. And what potassium leak channels do is they allow potassium, once it enters the cell, to exit the cell again, and it kind of allows this cycle to take place. As that potassium exits the cell, the cell becomes more negative because that's net positive charge leaving the inside of the cell, so it brings the cell down to a more negative state. So whereas the sodium potassium pump establishes the electrochemical gradient, these potassium leak channels help to maintain that. And these fixed anions within the cell, many of which are proteins, also play a critical role in maintaining that electrochemical gradient. So if I say describe the establishment of the electrochemical gradient, what I'm really asking you to do is describe the activity of the sodium potassium pump and explain to me why there's higher concentrations of sodium outside the cell than inside the cell, why there's higher concentrations of potassium inside the cell than outside the cell, right? and explain to me what's meant by primary active transport. Because the electrochemical gradient feeds into so many other physiological processes, it is a critical thing to understand prior to moving on in a class like anatomy and physiology. Now, there are two types of channels that I want to talk about. One of the types of channels that I want to talk about is what's called a ligand or a ligand-gated ion channel. Remember, ligands or ligands are just chemical messaging molecules. And the chemical messengers that we're most concerned with for this class are hormones and neurotransmitters. The focal point for this unit is going to be neurotransmitters. Now notice that this ligand-gated or ligand-gated ion channel is closed before it binds to its chemical signaling molecule. 
When that chemical signaling molecule, either hormone or neurotransmitter, a blank, an umbrella term for that is ligand or ligand, binds to that channel, it causes a conformational change or a shape change in which that channel opens up and that channel then allows the movement of ions. In this case, we're talking about calcium ions, so this would be called a ligand or ligand-gated calcium channel. Now the movement of those ions are going to change the relative charge states and they're going to influence membrane potential either making the inside of the cell more positive or more negative. And when you think about many of the neurotransmitter receptors that we're going to go over in this class, many of the receptors for neurotransmitters embedded in the dendrites of neurons are actually ligand-gated ion channels. So just keep that in mind. Now, another type of channel that's really important to understanding what's happening with respect to the neuron or any other cell that's electrically excitable is what's called a voltage-gated ion channel. Now, remember membrane potential is the charge difference between the outside and the inside of the cell. If we look at the inside of the cell here, the current charge is negative 70 millivolts. Now, voltage-gated channels, which aren't found in the dendrites, but they're found in the axon, don't bind to a chemical signaling molecule, and that's not the stimulus that changes them from being in a closed to an open state. The stimulus that influences voltage-gated channels is actually a change in the electrical charge within the cell. So if the change in the electrical charge within the cell, let's say, goes from negative 70 and it becomes more positive, going up to negative 50 millivolts, the electrical charge will cause a change in the shape of these voltage-gated channels, which are proteins, allowing, for example, either ions in or out. In this case, ions are flowing out of the cell. So we have two types of channels. We have ligand-gated or ligand-gated channels, and we have voltage-gated channels. Whereas ligand-gated channels, which are really receptors, are found in the dendrites of neurons. Voltage-gated channels are found within the axon of neurons, which are responsible for conducting electrical signals that we think of as being action potentials, and that's what we're going to discuss in just a moment. Now, key point two, we have nervous tissue, and we know that nervous tissue is made up of two different types of cells. The large cells with all the processes that are responsible for receiving, processing, and transmitting information in the form of electrical signals are called neurons. The support cells of neurons, which outnumber neurons by about 10 to 1, are neuroglial cells. So if I was to ask you to identify the specific tissue indicated by the image, I'm sure everybody in here could do that at this point. If I was to ask you to identify the specific cell types within the image and give me a functional role of each, I'm sure or feel confident that most people in here can do that. Identify the specific cell type. Identify the specific cell type. Now, when you think about nervous tissue, nervous tissue makes up organs within our nervous system. Our nervous system is composed of two major subdivisions. There's the central nervous system, which is made up of the brain and spinal cord. The job of the central nervous system is essentially to integrate or process information. The peripheral nervous system, which is made up of our spinal and cranial nerves and the associated sensory receptors and uh, junctions or places at which neurons tell things like muscles or glands or whatever what to do, that makes up the peripheral nervous system. So when you think about the three functional roles of the nervous system, they can essentially broken, be broken into uh, three categories. The peripheral nervous system is responsible for detecting sensory information. So here we have a little Meissner's corpuscle, and we have sensory input coming from the feel of this pen. So this pen distorts this little corpuscle, which triggers an electrical signal to be transmitted along what's called a sensory neuron. Now that sensory neuron isn't traveling all by itself. It's usually bundled with a bunch of other neurons, and in this case, it's forming part of a spinal nerve. Remember the peripheral nervous system, or P.N.S, is responsible for transmitting, um, is made up of cranial and spinal nerves, and its job, its first job, is to transmit sensory information to the central nervous system. So sensory information comes to the central nervous system where it's ultimately routed to where that information is going to be processed or integrated. 
the one word answer for the function of the central nervous system would be integration, which is really processing information. Once that sensory information is processed, an appropriate motor response, right, is decided on. Motor neurons are activated. Motor neurons, when they project out of the central nervous system and they transmit that information out to an effector, in this case, skeletal muscle, right, also travel along nerves. So when you think about the job of the peripheral nervous system, the job of the peripheral nervous system is to transmit sensory information to the central nervous system and to transmit motor information away from the central nervous system. If you think about the general trend, peripheral nervous system transmits sensory information to the central nervous system. The central nervous system processes that sensory information, makes sense of it, makes a decision about what to do. We call that integration, that processing of information. A motor response is then initiated, and the way that that information goes from being part of the brain out to the actual muscles that need to move is along a motor neuron, which is also part of one of your nerves. It could be a, a cranial nerve, but in this case, we're looking at a spinal nerve. So when you think about functions of the nervous system, the sensory and motor functions carrying information to and from, uh, to the central nervous system and from the central nervous system, the sensory and motor functions are peripheral nervous system functions. Whereas the integration or the processing of that information, right, and the decisions about what to do with information are an artifact or a function of the central nervous system. Now, when you think about the different divisions of the nervous system, we're going to ignore the um, enteric nervous system for just a little bit here, although it's extraordinarily important. We're just going to focus on these kind of simpler to understand things. When you think about the nervous system, and this is something that you're going to be asked about and asked to draw out, but I'm going to simplify it as much as I can for you. When you see information moving out this way, that's motor information. Another word for a motor pa pathway is called an efferent pathway. Efferent pathways or motor pathways transmit information from the central nervous system to the peripheral nervous system where they ultimately control something like a muscle or a gland. Sensory information, AKA afferent information, is information that's traveling from the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system. So when you think about the job of the peripheral nervous system, it's responsible for sensory and motor functions. When you think about the job of the central nervous system, it's responsible for integrating information. Now, when you think about the sensory systems, both sensory and motor systems can be broken into somatic or autonomic. Now, somatic and autonomic are different. Whenever you say somatic, what you're really talking about to a large degree is just information that's either being processed or initiated at a conscious level. So when you see somatic sensory receptors and somatic sensory neurons, what do I really mean by that? So what are some somatic sensory receptors? Well, receptors for touch, Receptors for pressure, receptors for vibration, receptors for proprioception, knowing where your body's uh, position is in space. Anything that's being processed at kind of a conscious level would be considered a somatic sensory um, experience. So if I give you a question on your handout, and I have given you some questions similar to this on your handout in which I say, which of the following, Je Jessica gets pricked by a needle and it's detected as being pain. Well, pain, temperature, touch, tickle, those are all somatic sensations. So that information would be picked up by something like a pain receptor. That pain receptor would then transmit that information along a somatic sensory neuron all the way to the central nervous system. So whenever I say a somatic sensation, I'm talking about a sensation that's being controlled at the conscious level. You are consciously aware of it. And think about those examples I've given you on your handout to kind of tie that together. Somatic motor, on the other hand, right, because we always have sensory and then we have motor and we're talking about the somatic nervous system. The effector of a somatic motor neuron is always skeletal muscle. 
And the reason for that is, is skeletal muscle is under voluntary or conscious control. And when we talk about things being somatic, what we're really saying is those processes happen at a conscious level, whether it be sensory input coming in or motor output going out, right? Those processes are being um, uh, handled by the nervous system at a level that comes into our conscious perception. So when I ask you, for example, to contract your biceps brachii muscle, you can do that. You can do that consciously. The effector of a somatic motor neuron, meaning what a somatic motor neuron controls, is always going to be skeletal muscle because skeletal muscle is under voluntary or conscious control. We also have the autonomic division of the nervous system. Now, the autonomic division of the nervous system, just like the somatic, has both sensory functions and motor functions, or afferent and efferent pathways. Now, autonomic sensory receptors are things like stretch receptors, chemoreceptors, or receptors that check to detect the changes in chemical concentrations. And what those receptors are detecting are stimuli coming from internal, internal stimuli. They're also called visceral sensory receptors. And that internal stimuli could be something like stretch on a blood vessel, right, which can tell your brain something about your blood pressure. So you can have stretch on a blood vessel and that information goes to your brain, but you never really think about it because you're not consciously monitoring that. And that's why it's called the autonomic nervous system. It's also called the visceral nervous system, which means pertaining to an organ. We don't consciously process information coming from the autonomic nervous system. So if I said the detection of changes in the concentration of blood plasma would most likely be carried out by which type of neuron. It wouldn't be a somatic sensory neuron, it'd be an autonomic sensory neuron, right? Or stretch on a blood vessel wall or something that we don't really think about from day in, day out. And uh, focus on those practice problems I've given you within your handout. The autonomic motor division, when I say autonomic motor or visceral motor division, the effector of autonomic motor neurons are always, right, things that we don't control at a conscious level, but that need to have some kind of input from the nervous system to know what they're doing, because the nervous system is an overarching system of homeostasis, tells other systems what to do. Now, the effector, or what autonomic motor neurons always control, is they control multiple tissues. But it's always either going to be smooth muscle, like in the lining of the blood vessels, cardiac muscle, which makes up a majority of the heart, or glands, which you find peppered all throughout your body, such as sweat glands. Now, the autonomic motor division is broken into the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions, which we later get into when we talk about um, the autonomic nervous system, specifically its motor branch. But just know for right now that we can break the nervous system down into these things. So if I say which of the following information would most likely be transmitted along a somatic sensory neuron as opposed to an autonomic sensory neuron, think about whether you're consciously aware of that or not. If I say which of the following would be an effector of a somatic motor neuron, it would always be skeletal muscle because right? Skeletal muscle is under voluntary control. And whenever we use somatic, when we're talking about the nervous system, we're talking about things under voluntary control or being consciously controlled. Whenever I ask what the effector of an autonomic motor neuron is, it's always either going to be cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, or glands. That's what the autonomic motor arm controls. It controls cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands. Now, when we look at nervous tissue, there are a couple of different cell types. The two cell types that we're focused on are neurons, which receive, process, and send information in the form of electrical signals called action potentials, and neuroglial cells, which provide all sorts of different support functions for the neurons, and we're going to talk about each one of those individually as we go through them. Now, characteristics of neurons that you should be familiar with. Neurons do not divide, so they're very long-lived cells. They're electrically excitable, meaning that they're capable of firing electrical signals called action potentials. And they have very high metabolic rates, meaning that they use a lot of energy. Now, the two processes or projections off of a neuron I want you to be most familiar with are dendrites. Dendrites 
receive information and they're capable of receiving information because they contain receptors for neurotransmitters. So they have these protein receptors embedded within the membrane of those dendrites that actually binds to neurotransmitters and triggers some kind of internal change in the neuron. Dendrites receive information. Axons, on the other hand, transmit information away in the form of an electrical signal called an action potential. So whereas dendrites receive information, axons transmit that information away. Whereas dendrites have receptors for neurotransmitters, axons have what are called voltage-gated ion channels. Now, if you look at this neuron, we'll go over the structures that become relevant for your exam. So here we have a typical neuron, and these processes or projections coming out of the top of the neuron here are dendrites. Remember, the most critical thing for you to remember about dendrites is they're peppered with protein receptors, and these protein receptors are responsible for receiving or detecting information. Because dendrites have these protein receptors, we say that dendrites receive information. The cell body or soma processes that information. Within the cell body or soma, you get these really dark staining granules called nissel bodies. Nissel bodies are essentially rough endoplasmic reticulum, and remember that that synthesizes proteins, and this rough ER is responsible for essentially making neurotransmitters and other proteins that the cell needs. So we have these nissel bodies, right, which is essentially darkly staining rough ER, and then we have our axon. Whereas dendrites have receptors for neurotransmitters, the axon, right, contains what are called voltage-gated ion channels. Once voltage-gated ion channels are activated, what they allow the axon to do is transmit an electrical signal called an action potential from one end of the neuron to the other end of the neuron. That electrical signal will then branch, branch, and it will eventually arrive at the very tips of the neuron, right, the very ends of the axon, and these very ends of the axon are referred to as synaptic end bulbs. Your lab refers to them as synaptic knobs, but they are synaptic end bulbs, uh, and they're, or synaptic knobs or terminal boutons. I'm going to use on my exam synaptic end bulbs, and those synaptic end bulbs ultimately communicate with another cell. Now, these cells that wrap around the axon providing electrical insulation so that action potential can be transmitted a little bit more quickly within the peripheral nervous system. It's important to note here that these cells are only found in the peripheral nervous system, meaning around the bundle of myelinated axons that make up nerves, either cranial nerves or spinal nerves. These cells that surround these neurons are called Schwann cells. They can also be called neurolemocytes, but I call them Schwann cells. And what these Schwann cells do is they wrap around the axon again and again and again. And by wrapping around the axon multiple times, they form this thick layer of fat, which provides electrical insulation. So the electrical signal doesn't dissipate out of one axon into another. The structure, not the cell type, but the structure that the Schwann cell forms when it wraps around the axon again and again and again in the peripheral nervous system is something called the myelin sheath. And it's the myelin sheath that ultimately allows electrical signals to be transmitted much more quickly. It provides electrical insulation. Now, in myelinated axons, what you'll see are these little gaps in between Schwann cells or in between the myelinated portions of the axon. And these little gaps are called nodes of Ranvier. So you can see that right here. And these nodes of Ron VA are responsible for allowing the electrical signal essentially to jump from one node to another node, which dramatically increases the rate or speed at which an electrical signal can be propagated. So when you think about all of the structures that you need to label on your handout associated with the neuron, those are kind of the major ones to draw a focal point to. Now the structure you're going to get in the lab is this model. This is the lab model for the neuron. It's on your common course objectives. You have for this introductory class, a set of structures that you need to know on the neuron. So if I expand beyond those, let me know. We'll get back to it. So these structures right here, 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 those are dendrites. 
Dendrites are responsible for receiving information. So all of these, dendrite, 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 dendrite. Those are responsible for receiving information. And the reason that they're capable of doing that is because they have receptors for neurotransmitters. The cell body, which I'm going to circle right here, is responsible for processing information. While the axon, right, and the initial point at which the cell body transitions to become the axon anatomically and functionally is called the axonal hillock. So this region right here is called the axonal hillock. This is where you see a transition between receptors for neurotransmitters and voltage-gated channels. It's those voltage-gated channels that allow an action potential to be transmitted. If you activate the area with voltage-gated channels, right, along the axonal hillock, we call it the trigger zone sometimes, what you are going to get is an all-or-none event called an action potential, which is an electrical signal traveling along the axon. The axon extends the entire length of the neuron. The axon is like a wire. It carries electrical signals called action potentials because it has voltage-gated ion channels within it that allow it to conduct that electrical current. And we're going to come back to that electrochemical gradient and how that plays into it. So we have our axon, which extends the entire length of the neuron. That's where you find voltage-gated ion channels. Now, coming back here, remember that this neuron is receiving information from other neurons. So what you are looking at right here are the terminal boutons or the synaptic end bulbs or the synaptic knobs, three different words to say the same thing. The synaptic end bulbs of other neurons originating in different areas. It's not a one-to-one -one neuronal communication pattern. Sometimes many neurons communicate with just one neuron and sometimes one neuron communicates with many other neurons. And we would, don't talk about that much in intro, so don't worry about it. So... Action potentials will arrive, trigger the release of chemical messengers called the neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters will bind to uh, neurotransmitter receptors. The dendrites receive information. The cell body processes that. And then the axon transmits that information away in the form of an electrical signal called an action potential. The cells surrounding these axons, the cell type, is a Schwann cell. The structure that Schwann cells form, if I was to put a little bracket around it and ask for the structure of myelin sheath, myelin sheaths provide electrical insulation, which allow the electrical current to uh, be transmitted much more quickly. In other words, an action potential can travel more quickly along the axon. These little gaps in between each Schwann cell are referred to as nodes of ron VA. These nodes of ron VA allow electrical signals to jump from one um, node to another, increasing the rate at which they're propagated. And then this structure right here that you're looking at is an extra layer of areolar connective tissue called the endoneurium. And this endoneurium wraps around the outside of these axons, providing an other layer, an extra layer of electrical insulation because these are such electrically excitable cells. So for intro, that's essentially what you need to know. Now, when you look at a neuron, we're talking about milliseconds here. Remember, there's a thousand milliseconds in a second. Dendrites receive information, right? So dendrites receive information. Golly. Okay. Dendrites receive information in the form of neurotransmitters. The cell body processes that information, and then the axon transmits that information away in the form of an electrical signal called an action potential. That electrical signal, which we're seeing reflected with this sodium movement, can then jump from one node of ron VA to the next, allowing it to be transmitted at a much more rapid pace. So... That's what the Schwann cells do. Sorry, distracted because of that phone call. Now, you have myelinated axons, which transmit electrical signals very quickly, but we also have what are called unmyelinated axons. And what you'll notice is in an unmyelinated axon, the point that that action potential is traveling along that axon is uh, much closer to the cell body than it is to the synaptic end bulbs, meaning that it hasn't traveled very far because neurons that are unmyelinated don't transmit electrical signals quite as quickly. Now, one of the things I want to discuss with you is the difference between depolarization, hyperpolarization, and repolarization. 
And one of the things I want you to really understand or realize, and I don't have a tablet to draw this out, so we're just going to focus on what happens in a cell during an action potential. Resting membrane potential, which is established by the sodium-potassium pump and maintained by things like potassium leak channels and the fixed charges inside the cell, is negative 70 millivolts. Now, when an action potential is fired along an axon, there has to be a stimulus for that to happen. And that stimulus is essentially, for the case that we're talking about right now, the binding of a neurotransmitter to a neurotransmitter receptor. When the cell gets depolarized to the point or it gets positive, more positive, and the polarity between the outside and the inside decreases or it depolarizes, when it depolarizes to what's called negative 55 millivolts, that is the magical point, that negative 55 millivolts, at which an action potential will be fired. And an action potential is an all or none event. Either the cell is going to fire an action potential or it's not. So if we look at this resting membrane potential here and we go step one, we have that net negative resting membrane potential because the sodium potassium pump is moving out three sodium ions, pumping in two potassium ions at the expense of one molecule of ATP. As a consequence of that, sodium builds up outside of the cell, potassium builds up inside of the cell, and we establish our electrochemical gradient, which we're then going to use to do work. Once the cell gets to negative 55 millivolts, specifically the axon of that cell, what ends up happening is you activate voltage-gated sodium channels. When voltage-gated sodium channels are activated, they go from being in a closed state to being in an open state. When they open, sodium rushes into the cell because you have that concentration gradient and that electrical gradient that promote its movement, so sodium rushes into the cell really fast. And it makes the cell become more positive really quickly. It changes the membrane potential, and that membrane potential spikes. That phase of an action potential in which the cell becomes more positive as the consequence of the opening of a voltage-gated sodium channel is called depolarization or the depolarizing phase. So how do we use this for things like pharmacology? Well, I'm sure many of you have probably heard the, of like lidocaine or benzocaine. Well, lidocaine and benzocaine, when you administer them, the reason they kill pain is they're what are called voltage-gated sodium channel blockers. They bind to sodium channels and they prevent the movement of sodium, which prevents depolarization, which prevents the action potential. If information can't be, get from being like, let's say, in your gums to your brain, it's like that information never occurred, so it has an anesthetic effect or it dampens down um, sensations of pain. Not because that stimulus isn't there, but because we're no longer getting the information to the brain to process that stimulus. So we have the depolarizing phase. At about positive 30, voltage-gated calcium, or uh, pardon me, sodium channels close and voltage-gated potassium channels open. Now remember, potassium has a higher concentration inside the cell than outside of the cell, so potassium will rush out of the cell. As potassium rushes out of the cell, as positive charge leaves the cell, the cell will become more negative. When you're returning that cell back to resting membrane potential, which is negative 70 millivolts, we refer to that as being the repolarizing phase or repolarization. And after the cell repolarizes, it reestablishes resting membrane potential. What allows it to reestablish resting membrane potential is the activity of the sodium potassium pump. So that's the depth. I go into much more depth in my intro class, right? The actual AMP1 for like the nursing profession. But for an intro class, this class, that's an adequate explanation of the action potential. So when I say the electrochemical gradient is necessary to fire electrical signals called action potentials, what I'm really saying is that we move ions around, right? In order to conduct electrical currents. And that's essentially what a battery does as well. If you've ever seen a battery as a positive and a negative end, right? You're just talking about cations moving toward anions and extracting energy from that. So that's what an action potential is. So if you look here, you get the transmission of an action potential along the axon of a neuron. And what ends up happening is sodium channels open. When sodium channels open, you have your resting potential, then you get the <laughs> 
depolarization, potassium channels open repolarization. So you're seeing this firing of an action potential. Now focus your attention up here, and we're going to wait for this to reset this GIF. Other neurons at their synaptic end bulb release neurotransmitters. Those neurotransmitters bind to neurotransmitter receptors on dendrites. That information is processed by the cell body, so we'll see it happen again. Neurotransmitter processed, right? And then what happens is voltage-gated sodium channels open up along the axon, and you get depolarization. Voltage-gated potassium channels that can get open, you get repolarization. And that's the firing of an action potential. It's just the movement of sodium and potassium. And that allows the cell to conduct an electrical current. Now, structural classifications of neurons you should be familiar with. Multipolar neurons are called multipolar neurons because they have multiple projections sticking out of their cell body. They are found all throughout the nervous system, but one of the things I want to highlight is that all motor neurons are multipolar. So when you think multipolar, think motor. So they can get input from a wide range of neurons and then ultimately transmit that information out to multiple effectors. Unipolar neurons are called unipolar because there's only one projection coming off the cell body. In other words, the dendrites here interact directly with the axon, so there isn't any dilution of the signal. Unipolar neurons are very good at detecting somatic sensory information, so things like touch, temperature, tickle, pain, autonomic sensory information, stretch or chemical changes, sensory neurons, both somatic and autonomic sensory neurons, right, that feed information from the uh, peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system, sensory neurons tend to be unipolar neurons. Bipolar neurons, where you have your dendrites and then a cell body in the middle and then your axon and your um, synaptic end bulbs where communication is going to happen, these are only found in your special senses, notably vision, hearing, equilibrium, and um, that's what we're going to focus on, and smell. So you find bipolar neurons in special sensory systems. Now, when you think about synaptic communication, and it's a long lecture, and this was one of your graded lecture days, so you're definitely going to have a little quiz over that. A simplified way of drawing one neuron communicating with another neuron is kind of like this ball and stick model. So here we have the dendrites in the cell body, here we have the axon, the synaptic end bulb, and here we have another neuron. We call the neuron doing the communication, the presynaptic neuron, the neuron receiving the communication, the postsynaptic neuron, and we often draw out what are called neuron pathways by drawing these simplified diagrams, even though they don't come near capturing the complexity that actually happens. Now, if I was to ask you to diagram out what happens at a synapse, now we've talked about synapses before, but what happens at a synapse, the point at which one neuron communicates with another neuron, what ultimately happens as a syn at a synapse is an action potential arrives at the synaptic end bulb of a neuron. It triggers the mobilization and release, or exocytosis, of a neurotransmitter. That neurotransmitter then binds to neurotransmitter receptors. These neurotransmitter receptors are located within the dendrite of the postsynaptic neuron. Those neurotransmitter receptors oftentimes are, if they're ionotropic, are ligand-gated ion channels. In this case, we have a ligand-gated sodium channel. Sodium rushes in. That makes the cell depolarize the threshold, which triggers the firing of an action potential. So that's the general trend of neuronal communication. Action potential arrives at synaptic end bulb, which triggers the exocytosis of neurotransmitter. That neurotransmitter binds to neurotransmitter receptors, which trigger essentially an action potential in that postsynaptic cell. Now, excitatory postsynaptic potentials are postsynaptic potentials in which you get a depolarizing shift in the postsynaptic neuron. The two neurotransmitters that you're going to have to know for this class are glutamate and GABA. Glutamate is like a molecular on switch. So what glutamate does is it activates different circuits in the brain, and by activating different circuits in the brain, it turns neurons on. So when you think about what's happening here, we have a presynaptic neuron here, 
and a postsynaptic neuron here. Action potential arrives at synaptic end bulb of the presynaptic neuron, which triggers the exocytosis of glutamate. Glutamate then binds to a receptor in the dendrite of the postsynaptic neuron. Glutamate receptors, for all intents and purposes, what we care about in this class are ligand-gated sodium channels. When glutamate binds to a glutamate receptor, which is really a ligand-gated sodium channel, sodium will rush from the outside to the inside of the cell, causing the cell to undergo what's called a depolarizing shift. That depolarizing shift before it reaches threshold is called a subthreshold potential. And subthreshold potentials never get to negative 55. Once it gets to negative 55, it goes from being what's called a graded potential to an action potential. The neurotransmitter for this particular exam that would cause a net depolarizing shift in membrane potential, meaning that would cause the cell to become a little bit more positive on the inside by allowing sodium to rush in is glutamate. Glutamate is always excitatory, meaning any neurotransmitter that brings the cell closer to negative 55 millivolts will always be an activating neurotransmitter. So if I was to ask you, put up this image and ask you, which of the following neurotransmitters could have triggered this change in membrane potential, glutamate? What ions are moving in where? Sodium from the ECF to the ICF. Would this be considered a depolarizing or hyperpolarizing potential? Definitely a depolarizing potential because the cell is becoming more positive. And depolarizing potentials are always, always, always excitatory. So our primary on switch in the nervous system is glutamate. Our primary off switch in the nervous system is another neurotransmitter called GABA. Whereas glutamate receptors, many of them are ligand-gated sodium channels, GABA receptors are ligand-gated chloride channels. When GABA binds to a GABA receptor on the dendrite of a postsynaptic neuron, <clears throat> it triggers the opening of these ligand-gated chloride channels. And because chloride carries a negative charge, as chloride rushes into the cell, it doesn't call this, cause the cell to depolarize or get more positive. It causes the cell to hyperpolarize or get more negative. Whenever a neuron hyperpolarizes, it's going to shut down and it's no longer going to be firing action potentials. So GABA is like a neurological off switch. So we have glutamate, which turns cell neuron pathways on, and GABA, which turns neuron pathways off. When you look at the shift in membrane potential, because it becomes more negative, we refer to that as hyperpolarizing because it's becoming even more different than the outside of the cell. And hyperpolarizing potentials are always inhibitory, meaning that they turn cells off. So whereas glutamate activates neurons in cell pathways and neuronal pathways, GABA turns those neuronal pathways off. In fact, ethanol, the type of alcohol you drink, is what's called the GABA agonist, meaning it turns GABA receptors on. When GABA receptors are activated, cells, and specifically neurons in your brain, start to hyperpolarize. They're no longer able to do what they're supposed to do. They've been inhibited. If that hyperpolarization is due to an artificial, or not an artificial, but an externally introduced substance like ethanol, that can cause major problems with like your equilibrium balance, the way you think, should I or should I not call an X at 3 a.m., right, type of decision-making skills. So, neurotransmitter that would stimulate a hyperpolarizing potential, GABA. Ions that move in this case would be chloride. Is it depolarizing or hyperpolarizing? It's hyperpolarizing because it's dropping below negative 70, right? Repolarizing is coming back to negative 70. Hyperpolarizing is dropping below. And would it be considered excitatory or inhibitory? Definitely inhibitory. Now, the final topic we're going to talk about is neuroglial cells. Neuroglial cells are essentially support cells for neurons. And they differ between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Now, the only type of neuroglial cell you have to know for the peripheral nervous system is a Schwann cell. So Schwann cells surround the neurons that form cranial nerves and spinal nerves because it's cranial nerves and spinal nerves that are the peripheral nervous system. In fact, a bundle of myelinated axons in the peripheral nervous system, by definition, is a nerve. 
So Schwann cells wrap around and around, they form myelination, and what they do is they allow electrical signals to be cross or to be transmitted a little bit more quickly. The same can't be said for the central nervous system. The central nervous system has a different constellation of neuroglial cells. Now you can pause here and read the main functions of each as we go through them on these uh, models. Right, so you can pause there, you can get a major function of each, and then we're going to go through them. So if I was to say identify the cell type indicated by the pointer, that would be a Schwann cell, right? Schwann cells are only found in the peripheral nervous system, so you know every neuron cell model that we have in our class has to be a peripheral nervous system neuron. If I was to say identify the structure formed, it would be a myelin sheet. And what do myelin sheets do? They provide electrical insulation so action potentials can travel more quickly. Now in the central nervous system, when you look at this image, view this as being a chunk of brain. Here we have the neurons in the brain, and here we have the neuroglial cells, and here we have a blood vessel, specifically a capillary running through the brain. Now, when you think about neurons, neurons need support. Structural support, metabolic support, nutritional support, etc. One of the cells that supports neurons in the Central nervous system, meaning the brain and the spinal cord, is what's called an oligodendrocyte. Oligo means many and dendro means processes, so it's a cell with many processes. Oligodendrocytes look kind of like octopus, right? Like the, the legs of an octopus. And then oligodendrocytes, again, have these cytoplasmic extensions that wrap around and around and around a neuron's axon where they form electrical insulation called myelin sheaths. So if I was to say Schwann cell is to peripheral nervous system as blank is to central nervous system, what forms myelination around the neurons in the central nervous system? Oligodendrocytes. Why is it more efficient? It's a space-saving mechanism because our central nervous system is encapsulated in a, in a cranial cavity, right? So it takes up less space. You get more bang for your buck. And there are other reasons for it, but we'll just leave it at that. So when you think about multiple sclerosis, multiple sclerosis is what's called the demyelinating disorder of the central nervous system. Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease in which cells in the central nervous system are destroyed by our body's own immune responses. And what ends up happening is essentially we have these microglial cells, which are immune cells in the central nervous system, and they come through and they start destroying myelination. And when that myelination in the neurons in the brain gets destroyed, you can't move information around, right? That information doesn't get where it needs to go as efficiently. Guillain-Barre is a demyelinating disorder of the peripheral nervous system. Again, it's an autoimmune disease, but in this case, because it's the peripheral nervous system, right, and it affects the structure surrounding the neurons that make up the nerves, you don't get the same constellation and set of symptoms. And it can be just as devastating, although we tend to recover a bit better from Guillain-Barre syndrome than MS. Uh, this damage tends to be permanent. Some of this damage can be reversed, but we, again, we won't get into that too much. So you have these uh, Schwann cells forming this myelin sheath, and Guillain-Barre is an autoimmune disease that destroys those. I've seen kids with rapid onset Guillain-Barre go from essentially being normal the next day to being completely paralyzed with long, really drawn out uh, recovery processes. And they're both demyelinating disorders. It's just that in the central nervous system, it's oligodendrocytes being affected, whereas in the peripheral nervous system, it's Schwann cells being affected. The other type of cell I want to talk about are what are called astrocytes. Now, astrocytes, job number one I want you to know is that they don't make the blood-brain barrier, but they help maintain the blood-brain barrier. Now, the blood-brain barrier consists of tight junctions among all the epithelial cells and the capillary networks that feed your brain. So the blood-brain barrier is made up of a series of cell junctions between these simple squamous epithelial cells that prevent uh, the movement of solute from the bloodstream into the brain. Whereas the capillaries and the tight junctions make up the blood-brain barrier, astrocytes help to maintain the blood-brain barrier, preventing it from breaking down and protecting the brain from uh, solutes that we don't want in there. Now, astrocytes also provide structural support, metabolic support, help with neurotransmitter cycling. I mean, they do an extraordinary array of tasks. 
Microglial cells are immune cells of the central nervous system. Essentially what they do when they're activated is they go and target little dirt, debris, pathogens, they engulf them, and they destroy them because neurons are never coming into direct contact with blood in the central nervous system. We need innate or inherent immune properties to the central nervous system. And what uh, microglial cells do is they serve that functional role. They essentially uh, serve an immunological role within the central nervous system where they target pathogens um, and things like that for destruction, debris, cellular debris, etc. So if you were to take like cerebrospinal fluid from somebody and you were to see that microglial cells were elevated, it may be indicative of something like an infection because the only reason that they'd start to divide like that is in response to some kind of infectious agent. Now these cells down here we're going to talk about in much more detail when we get into the brain and spinal cord. They're called the pindamal cells. For right now I just want you to know ependymal cells are responsible for synthesizing cerebrospinal fluid or CSF, C as in cat, S as in Sam, F, F as in fan. And that's essentially all we got for this particular lecture. So have a great day, y'all. Bye-bye, y'all. Bye-bye.